Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 152. If something's important enough, even if the odds are against you, you should still do it. Elon Musk. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. And if you guys are looking for stock footage, After Effects templates, motion graphics, Video Blocks is the site, man. I've been using them for years now. I use some clips of theirs in my movie, This Is Meg, for some stock footage. And this month alone, they're launching a new crazy collection of hundreds of new Unreal clips, including space, virtual reality, deep water, fantasy, and sci-fi footage. All of that comes free with your subscription, and it is a limited time. And you also get free 4K clips with your membership at no cost. And Videoblocks is now giving you seven days of free downloads. Download a ton of stuff for free. Check it out. See what's going on with it. And remember, whatever you download during those seven days is yours for free, royalty-free forever. So definitely give them a shot. So head over to videoblocks.com forward slash Indie, I-N-D-I-E. That's videoblocks.com forward slash indie for the Indie Film Hustle special discount price. And today's show is also sponsored by Distriber. If you guys are trying to get your movies or feature films or even shorts onto Netflix, Hulu, Google Play, iTunes, Fandango, or any of the major streaming services, Distriber finally lets you in without having to go through a traditional distributor. And you keep 100% of all the revenues and your rights. So if you want more information, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. So today's episode, guys, is a huge, huge treat. It is an epic, epic podcast. Uh, And I'll talk to you a little bit about my guest in a second. But you guys have been listening to me talk about the show I've been working on for the last uh, five, five or six months. Uh, which is called Dimension 404 for Hulu and Lionsgate. I've been uh, I was hired to do all the color grading and online editorial and deliverables for the show. Uh, it's an amazing anthology series, six episode run with an insane cast. And you know I've it's some of the best work as far as my color work is concerned I've ever done in my career. I'm really really proud of the work that I've done on it. So you guys are if you guys have Hulu, definitely check out Dimension 404. But One of the other great benefits of working on Dimension 404 is I got to meet the founders of Rocket Jump, uh, Freddie Wong, Matt Arnold, and uh, Des Dolly. And, you know, I've been picking their brains for the last six months uh, here and there at lunches and in sessions and stuff like that, trying to kind of figure out how they were able to build this insane online empire. Now, if you guys don't know who Rocket Jump is, just go to YouTube and type in Rocket Jump and you'll see. There's some OGs in the YouTube space. They were they they started back in around 2010 and uh their story is is pretty remarkable. They've got close to 8 million followers on YouTube and they've been able to unlike other YouTubers, they've been able to leverage their audience on YouTube to start creating higher end content with bigger and bigger budgets. And again, like unlike other YouTubers, they actually start seeing a plan uh, far ahead of the game. They start seeing around the corner. They're like, "Look, we don't want to keep doing just YouTube videos all for the rest of our lives. We want to actually start creating more narrative content, episodic content, feature films, things like that." And what they were able to do with the Rocket Jump brand is is pretty remarkable and kind of unheard of in the YouTube space. And Dimension 404 is by far their most ambitious and largest budget production they've ever undertaken. And it is epic. What they were able to do with the budget they had is is kind of remarkable. I know we had over 1,400 visual effect shots that I personally inserted every single one of them into each episode uh, throughout the series. And it's pretty remarkable what these guys did. So I wanted to get Des Dolly, who is the executive producer and also showrunner of Dimension 404 on the show, so we could pick his brain a bit about how they built an audience, uh, how they've been able to uh, leverage that audience, you know, create content for that audience, 
and build careers basically off of YouTube. Their story is kind of crazy, and Dez's story specifically is pretty inspiring and, and just plain amazing. And, you know, it's, it's you know, we talk a little bit about this in the episode. You know, it's about the right place, right time, right product. Same thing with Kevin Smith or Robert Rodriguez. But, uh, you know, any of these guys that you just hit at the right moment. And Rocket Jump uh, with Freddie, Matt, and Dez, they all hit at the right moment. But they kept going with it. They didn't just sit on their laurels. They actually started building something, building a real production company, building up some something that can actually do more than just fun little YouTube videos but actually take it to a whole other level. And that's what they did. So I drove over to Rocket Jump headquarters and sat down with Dez and really just beat him up. <laughs> no, I, I actually picked his brain with every, for every an- question I wanted an answer to. And, and hopefully, you know, a lot of the stuff he talks about, you guys can apply to your careers and your filmmaking journey. But it's a pretty inspiring story but also just knowledge bomb on top of knowledge bomb on top of knowledge bomb was dropped um, from a perspective of someone who, you know, he's not a, a YouTuber all the way. You know, he is, you know, he went to USC film school. So he did grow up in that 90s independent film world. You know, the Robert Rodriguez, the Kevin Smith, the Quentin Tarantino's, that world, but also has not only a foot in that world, but has a foot in the YouTube world. So he's a very unique individual because he's able to kind of straddle those two worlds and uh, it's pretty pretty insane man so i just want you guys to sit back this is a long one it's going to be you know almost by the time we're done with this episode it's going to be almost two hours but i guarantee you if you stick to it there is some major major stuff in this episode that you guys are just going to love and uh just just get ready to write some stuff down man so without any further ado here is my epic podcast with des dolly i'd like to welcome to the show the one the only des dolly from rocket jump sir thanks for jumping on oh thanks for having me how are you i'm good man i'm good uh for all you guys that don't know me and des have been in the uh the trenches now for a few months now oh, tre- well. we've been we've been at the uh indie film hustle uh base <laughs> camp <laughs> yes, headquarters you, yes, for since when well no I, originally i came on in june <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> of last year, oh. uh, and then uh, and our our fearless post production supervisor leader uh, <laughs> told me, no, they're just going to do a few reshirts, and then I didn't get anything till November. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I think when I first got Matchmaker was in November for uh, for the show. We we definitely underestimated how many pickups we would be doing on this show. Yes, <laughs> uh, and we we greatly underestimated the amount of visual effects in the show as well. But we'll get into we'll get into Dimension Four Hundred Four in a little bit. I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit about uh your past deep these deep oprah questions i'm going to be asking you so prepare yourself <laughs> are you gonna make me cry if, if you Bar- were a tree Barbara what Walter kind style? of if you were a tree what kind of tree you would be no um <laughs> <laughs> a, tall, a tall one a tall a, a tall, tall so- thin handsome one <laughs> <laughs> super that, rich that all the other trees in, wanted to be incredibly with incredibly <laughs> wealthy popular tree <laughs> so um so let's let's take it back all the way to the beginning all right um what made you want to make movies because it's a crazy business that's a good question <laughs> uh what made me want to make movies and then what made yeah. you stay in the business after you went down the path it wasn't the money <laughs> obviously <laughs> um uh, okay so taking you back that's a good question so you know it's funny when i was home for christmas uh this past holiday my family and i were going through old family videotapes like mm-hmm. vhs cassette tapes what are these vhs's know? you speak of yeah, right. <laughs> uh, this is a big thing. It recorded to magnetic tape. Anyway. You're, you're speaking gibberish. I know. <laughs> Sorry, YouTube. YouTube gener- You guys have tuned in to speak to some hip, young YouTube generational type, and I am so not that. Um, I, I'm one foot in and out of this generation. Yeah. But so anyway, so we were looking at my father's VHS tapes of us, and we went back to some of the earliest ones, and I think I was five, six years old, mm-hmm. opening a – a highly a thick detailed book on elements of production design wow. and costume design and all this stuff. And I'm I'm watching this tape, looking at my parents, like, did I ask for that? Like, uh-huh. I, how I was that into 
the mechanics of filmmaking back then. You know, back then. When it wasn't a cool thing, don't forget. I mean, when you were doing this, it's not like now that everybody's a filmmaker. Oh, no. This was back when they were still stuffing nerds in lockers. Yeah. Yeah. This is. (laughs) We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. (laughs) <laughs> it was I was I was the weird dolly. You yeah, know, I got two younger brothers. <laughs> Everyone was uh, in my family, except for me, of course, very athletic. Mm-hmm. My family is sort of uh, famous in the region for wrestling, uh-huh. not pro wrestling, uh-huh. uh, actual real wrestling, as the mid- not, Midwest folks not call Jimmy, it. Jimmy, F- uh, so, Jimmy F- Snookerfly, uh, uh, Superfly uh, Snooker. No, n- well, n- that's a whole other. You have to get my brother on your show to talk about pro wrestling. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was. Look, my father was into film. Okay. He was always a fan. Loved the monster films, uh, especially like the Universal monster movies. Sure. Uh, he had gone to the drive-in with his buds when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how um, his friend's parents used to babysit them. So he had – he was a bit of a cinephile. He was definitely a genre freak. Mm-hmm. And – I don't know. That was just something that we did very early on. We bonded over that. We're, I'm part of that young video generation. The so. video store generation. Exactly. Sure. You know, not having a lot of money as a kid. Weekends were the Friday was the night to go to the video store. Absolutely. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna get a stockpile of tapes. We're gonna get one for the family to watch, one for the brothers to watch. You know, and then God, and then one it, weird one. You know, that was just that was that was it. it like it, now, would, it's you like- would make selections based on. Like box cover art, cardboard cover oh, art. God, I love those days. You would find these strange gems, yeah, but that's just what we did as a family. And um, I can't recall. I couldn't put a fine point on it. It mm-hmm. just felt as you know, strangely enough, like that love was always there. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I think after I saw probably like Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, mm-hmm. and you've got the fighting skeletons, the famous of course, um, Ray uh, Harryhausen and stop motion yeah. animation, Jason, the Argonauts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see that. And, and I, I really got into that. I remember having a love for stop motion cinema. I was really into magic at the time, just the illusions mm-hmm. that you can create. Smoke and mirrors. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, my dad had this VHS camera that, you know, he used for shooting family stuff. And he and I, when I was, uh, you know, somewhere around six to eight started making stop motion animated films. You know, I'd make little clay creatures and monsters. They're all genre films. Sure. Um, my first one was a monster movie. Uh, the second one was a war epic, all stop motion, <laughs> little green army men. I had a big spruce nice. cruise, you know, and we did a lot of in-camera sound effects and stuff like that. Um, it was just, I don't know, man. That love was always there. Mm-hmm. And I never knew how to, I was always struggling to find a way to develop it, mm-hmm. how to learn more. I was so hungry there was nothing uh, to, to out be there. involved in show business, and I you nothing. couldn't. Yeah, you didn't have nothing. special features. I remember. Do you remember that Discovery Channel show? Yes, like movie, um, magic? movie magic. Movie magic. I, that would. I would. That was okay. Mind blown. Here for, for your audience, uh, for the, the the three old guys out there listening to this. <laughs> There's I, a you, few more of us. You'd have to there. go to. Yeah, you'd have to go to the. I would go to the newspaper uh-huh. or a TV guide. What is this newspaper or TV it, guide? It, you speak exactly. Of? <laughs> And you would look up the time and date of movie the magic. next show in yeah. a oh, movie yeah. magic. Yeah. There was no so DVR. I could plan around it. Oh yeah. Be home and have a fresh videotape ready to record, record it yeah. and then study it. Yeah. You know? And oh, yeah. if you'd missed it, you'd never get to see it again. That the was one, the fear. The one that got me, because I had I watched all of those. Yeah. And then they came on video. Yeah. Years later, they came oh, on did video. Did they really? They came on video. I'd years love to go later. back and watch those. Yeah. They're, they're they're just genius. Yeah. But the one that stuck with me was the making of T2. Yep. The making of T2 blew my mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I never, and I just watched watching it. I'd watch James Cameron do all this stuff and they, the way they shot the the chase in, in the L.A. River mm-hmm. and all this stuff. And the VFX, I mean, can you, I mean, back in 91 when that came out. I remember there was more than most films in that era. That was the one that just happened to be this huge swirling storm of supplementing supplementary oh God, yeah, material. wasn't it? It was just a massive blockbuster and it had, you know, a lot of really cool effects. So Groundbreaking. A, a lot of a lot of stuff that came out around that movie. I remember that. I remember I had the book. You could Oh God, I go, oh, yeah. You know, I, I found a couple of catalogs and you could order some filmmaking books or like um theatrical makeup and wardrobe costume design books mm-hmm. out of the backs of these catalogs. It's um, nothing like today that you could I, literally just log onto your phone and hit you have a thousand just film podcasts. A thousand film podcasts. A thousand tutorials. You have full film schools online. Yeah, that you can just learn anything and everything you ever wanted to know. No, it was a it was a treasure hunt, and that I think that was part of the thrill. Mm-hmm. You know, 
tracking this stuff down. And um, yeah, you know, I was just, I was always into making things. I was like a crafty type. I was an indoor kid for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, my brothers wanted to go out and play and go to wrestling where practice were you and in, stuff where were like you that. Based in? I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, or, okay. or Mishawaka rather, okay. Okay. Uh, the Princess City. Mm -hmm. So it's right where Notre Dame is. Town wouldn't exist if it weren't for the university. Of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're... I saw Rudy. I know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Had a lot of family in the background in, yeah. in Rudy. Yeah. That was that was the, a big to do when Rudy by, came to by, town. By the way, if everyone listening, if you haven't seen Rudy, you've you've got to watch Rudy. Yeah. And oh, you will. Well, yes. Of course. And you will cry your eyes out. I don't care how big of a fucking dude you are. You will cry your eyes out. But our <laughs> that was our life. Notre Dame. Yeah. It still is. Like yeah. that region. It's all Notre Dame football. That's all that matters. There's some parts of Indiana where it's all basketball, but right there it's in my hometown, most of my family went through Notre Dame. Most of my family still works at Notre Dame. Like and I obviously, had and obviously, jobs there. I went to school there for a time. Like that is what you do when you grow up in that region. You but, live and breathe Notre Dame. But it's obviously a a film mecca as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you had an amazing support yeah, Sydney around. Pollock the, went through. Uh, who did? No, uh, Sydney. Yes, and Sydney Pollock. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. He went to Notre Dame, right? Did he? Oh, I'm yeah. sure he did. But like, he went to Notre Dame. But uh, the film school is not really. Is there a film school? I don't even think there is. <laughs> they they have one. They have a, they have a media department. Let's just I, when I was choosing between that or USC, I, I, you know, I think you chose you chose which which know. brings us to USC. Sure. So how was your experience at USC? Because I I was I had the pleasure of speaking at USC the other day, mm -hmm. and uh, I first time I walked into the campus, and I was just like, you know, the Lucas Building and the Spielberg Building, yeah. and the and you just kind of sense. All the stuff that's happened. There. There's an energy there. There is there? an energy at that place that is pretty freaking cool. Mm -hmm. Like you could just like, oh yeah, um, Lucas was walking down these halls and Cop mm -hmm. not Coppola was at UC UCLA, but you I mean just a list of people. Ronnie Howard. Yeah, Ronnie Howard and, and a million <laughs> Robert other. Robert Zemeckis. Yeah, I mean the list goes on and on. All, all USC grads. So how was your experience at your time? When did you go in the '90s? Right. I graduated in uh, no, it was the. Uh, early 2000s? Early 2000s. I graduated in 2009. Oh, okay, okay. 2010. I okay. got there I got there at 2000 2006. Okay. I had transferred from I did um oh, You did all 4 years there. I did two and a half. I was mm -hmm. a transfer student. I came in during the spring. I did a couple of years at uh art school in Chicago. Mhm. Mm uh where I was getting more of like a broad art history mm -hmm. degree knowing that that would you know, feed my my film background while I was trying to get into a film school somewhere. Gotcha. Because um, that art degree ain't paying the bills. Hell no. <laughs> you know, I, and I'll admit I, I wasn't – I still didn't – again, because the internet was very premature then, it, I didn't quite know where – to, how to take that next step. Sure. I knew, okay, Chicago's two hours away. There's an art school there. That's mm -hmm. where, that's where I'll start, you know, and um, just, to, you know, digging through phone books and, and calling universities and having to do all that hard work. I found out, okay, USC is, sounds like the place to go. Okay. So that's, I'm naive like that. I'll, um, I, I decide, okay, that's where I'm going to go now. <laughs> and so just worked and worked and worked for years, building my grades up and building you were my like portfolio. Rudy. You were like Rudy. I was the Rudy of, of USC. USC. <laughs> <laughs> USC filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. No, I, look, I, I remember the day I, I put all my eggs in that basket. So I you had no backup plan other than you. It's I basically going, I'm only, my, my distribution, my distribution plan is Sundance and that's it. <laughs> that's well, essentially, that's, it. you know, that's, that's how it works though. You know, like by then you, uh, I had read a handful more film books. Mm -hmm. There's a little, some of that stuff was becoming more popular. The Sundance generation made, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of filmmaking more popular yeah, to, the Tarantino, a, to a broad Archie, audience, Smith, you sure, know, so sure, you could, sure. You could get Robert Rodriguez's book, or you could get Easy Rider's oh, Raging Bulls. A, well, oh God! You know, Rebels on the Backlot. Learn more about filmmaking, and so I realized, okay, so th this is how a lot of folks do it. You get to film school, or at least you get rejected, and then you use that as fuel. So that's the next step. I need to try to get into film school. Now I'll put money together, go do an independent film, take that to Sundance. It'll win, uh, you It'll know, win. Sundance, and then I'll have a career. You, you know, you'll I'll get Michael Ovitz to come in. He'll represent yeah, you, and right. the rest is history. Right. So right. I was like, okay. Uh, USC Film School. I did apply everywhere. Okay, and got in nowhere except for USC. It was the last place I heard from, and I got in. And I remember <laughs> dancing <laughs> in front of my mailbox. That's just crazy. So you get rejected from all the yeah. other schools, but the the number one film school in the country said, "Yeah, okay, we'll take you." I, you know, I <laughs> so a lot of a lot of schools uh, just looked at your grades. My grades were they were great. 
Uh, so I don't really know how they were making those distinctions. USC specifically, you had to write a lot of creative material. Mm -hmm. And I was always into creative writing mm -hmm. when I was a kid. So I think I had a leg up there as opposed to places like NYU where they were actually looking at a portfolio of short films. Mm -hmm. And mine were garbage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. frankly. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, that's why I was going to film school <laughs> to learn how to, to learn better. how to make better films. Sure, so sure, sure. I don't. Yeah, I'm not surprised that they would look at that and go, this kid. He's, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, USC, I was able to sort of swindle my way in there with some colorful essays and stuff like that. But you, but at USC, from what I understand from talking to a lot of USC grads, uh -huh. it's it's not only the education, which is wonderful, but it's the connections and the yeah. relationships that you build at that school that kind of help you propel to the next level. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I met uh, my, my partners to this day, Matt Arnold and Freddie Wong, in a uh, practical special effects class, mm -hmm. taught by a gentleman by the name of um, Tom Anderson, who ran the optical printer mm -hmm. on the original Star Wars title crawl. You know, like this was an old school guy. It was like the last film class there at the university. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We shot stuff on 35 and you learned how to do like hyperfocal calculations mm -hmm. and um, force perspective. When you and, really needed to know what you were well, doing. You, yeah. You know, <laughs> like there was math involved in filmmaking. Um, <laughs> but we like, you know, I met guys like that and we bonded over that. And I have so many friends that I met at USC and we all still work together. Like everyone on my crew is either someone I met at USC mm -hmm. or they're a friend of someone I met at USC or they auditioned, you know, or sent in a resume and you see, oh, they went through USC. I know that they probably, you know, like myself, got a, a well-rounded education there. You know, I'll, I'll give them a shot. Now, a, very similar to me, you came into the business through Post. You opened yes. up your own Post house. Yeah, absolutely. Back in the day. So how did that help you move to your next level? How important is Post in your whole journey as a filmmaker? Because I always preach it like like crazy. Like you guys got to know Post. If you don't know Post, the days of you know wearing the monocle and the, the bullhorn and just being the director is – those days are gone, in my opinion. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're gone. Um, I feel like filmmaking has, and I'm not saying this is the way, I'm not endorsing this. It's mm -hmm. not the way it should be. Um, but certainly when you're looking at the, a lot of the young up-and-coming filmmakers, mm -hmm. you're looking at a lot of folks on YouTube and stuff like that, filmmaking is mostly post-production. It's very post-heavy. <laughs> not necessarily a lot of thought put into story and character right. and the production. It's mm -hmm. all about like, let me get the coolest camera and I'll just point it at stuff and I'll throw it in After Effects and I'll really fuck with it until it's good. Right. Exactly. Um, or I'll fix it in color. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I don't really know how that applies to me. I guess I'm just sort of commenting on the, the state of things. Sure, sure. USC prepares you. I mean, they make no bones about it that they're preparing you for a role, entry level role in the business, and I'm talking like a, a, a coffee pouring yeah. PA. Yeah. Uh, and I always found that frustrating. That whenever I expressed bigger ambition, they were like they would sort of scoff and laugh, and you know, a lot of they were teachers that weren't working in the business, so you wonder if there's jealousy or whatever. Uh, there's Envy. some cynicism there. Sure, you know um, they've gotten their asses kicked, and now they're back to teaching. Um, not to say that all teachers are, are that. Not to knock teachers. We, I had fantastic teachers there. Mm -hmm. But there was just, just this air of you could sense from the faculty oh, that I this know. is going to be tough. And, and they, you know, they never sugarcoated that. Like most of you, I remember orientation day. It was – they would show us short films of um, – I remember Justin Lin. They showed us the Justin yeah, sure. Lin short film. Sure. And I remember being oh, – I was, I was floored. And they said, okay, this is the one student who's off uh, doing something now. N the rest of you won't make it. You know, look around. There's like, what, 150 of you here. One of you will make it. Everyone else will be, you know, schlepping XLR cable the rest of their lives. So you need to buckle down. You need to work hard. And one of these folks sitting next to you is going to offer you a job one day. So you need to get to know them. So it was like boot camp. It, it really prepared mm -hmm. you for getting your ass handed to you out mm -hmm. here. Um, and it does. Yeah. Oh, it does. The business. Every day. Every, even to this day. <laughs> every day. Um, you know, so I uh, still having that, I mean, coming up, being a fan of, you know, the film school kids, or not mm -hmm. the film school kids, but like the Sundance kids, Tarantino and Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. at the those, those guys were guys, heroes yeah. at of course. the time. You know, yeah. like, oh, these are dudes who just went out and made it happen, mm -hmm. you know, and, and coming off of 
sort of that cynical feeling, that, that yucky feeling in the film school when everyone's saying you're probably not going to make it mm-hmm. and the industry is impossible. I'm saying well, I've read these books. These guys went and just charged a movie on their credit card and made it work. I will will this into existence. Yeah, I'm not. I remember having coffee with with um, classmates and peers those last couple of weeks of school and everyone's looking at each other with just that that face, those like, that eye, oh my, that, like, what that are we terror. Do? Who is going to actually give me a job? Nobody's going to let me make a movie. And I said, then let's go make a movie. And But the thing is, at the time you came, came out was when you graduated, what, 2009, 10, 9, 10, right? yeah. The technology had gotten to a point where you could go do it on the cheap. And it taken yes. a bit because when I made my short mm-hmm. in 05 – the tech and it was the DVX 100A. Yeah, Final Cut was just coming into its own. The technology was just starting to get there, and it was I was still standard def. Yeah, you had already gotten to the, even gotten cheaper, more powerful. Yeah, but you know what they did in the '90s? That was ballsy. That was ballsy. That was like you know, hey, we're taking 27 grand, shooting on black and white film in a fucking convenience store. Yeah, and editing on a flatbed. Right. in their apartment, like that's yeah. it's uh, commendable. God bless them. Right. <laughs> no, I had the benefit of. Uh, after a effects. cheap After Effects package, you know, sure. and having a copy of Final Cut from school. Literally, uh, Freddie and I would go down into the archives at USC and we would burn CDs with uh, sound effects from oh, the I USC oh, library. Yeah. Oh, I just, I, oh, God. You know? So, and, and, and stock footage. Yeah. Stock footage just from art beats exactly. and stuff like that. I, have, I still got books full of bootleg versions. Yep. I've got all that stuff. Yeah. But then, you know, the Red One camera came out. That was around then, yeah. And, uh, I realized, okay, I, I only really need to get together like 20 grand. To buy it. To just make a film. I can yeah. rent one. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. hire a crew and I could afford – I basically did the math, ran the numbers and like the, the least amount I could put together a movie for uh, would be about 20 grand. You know, Well, I could have done it for cheaper but I figured no, with the people I knew, that's the bare minimum I could raise. Right, right. You right. know, uh, and the maximum. <laughs> um <laughs> So, so I just I said the hell with it. I told my buddies, you know, they looked at me like I was crazy, but I said it has to be. This has to be crazy. Uh, but you know, you, you need be to be crazy. naive in this business to make something happen. And nutty. Yeah. So I said, let's go make a movie. I, you know, and then I was forced to put my money where my mouth was, so to speak. I just, I told everyone we're going to do it. We're going to, I don't know how, but we'll raise the money. I'll write mm-hmm. the script. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all just, it was madness. But I told everyone and I convinced a bunch of friends, like, you're going to you're gonna fly out to my house this summer right after commencement. You're going to live at my place and we're going to shoot a movie. And everyone went, okay. that's not, We had literally nothing else planned. <laughs> so I wrote a, uh, a sports comedy based upon my experience um, in youth wrestling okay. in the region okay. and starred my brother. And was definitely heavily influenced by a lot of independent comedies, you know, your your clerks and whatnots. Um but it had this – I had seen uh, Foot Fist Way around the time I was graduating with Danny McBride, uh, yes. written and directed by Jody Hill, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Virginia Boys. And it, that really floored me that you could do something dark and I had a really twisted sensibility. So I thought, you know, uh, my brother is a bit of a character. Let's sort of create this little fun vehicle for him, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, he was, he had been the star of all my short films and stuff like that, uh, all those years. So it just made sense. Put together a prospectus, uh, based upon basically a formula that I, I pulled from the, um, Evil Dead Companion. Yeah. Written by, uh, Rob Tappert and Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, which chronicled the way they put together the original Evil Dead film. Mm-hmm. Literally laid out how they put a business together. Mm-hmm. Every single step and then sold stock in the business to dentists. So I did the exact same thing. <laughs> and I created a, 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 co- a corporation for this movie and sold stock to friends and family and anyone whose ear, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I could talk God, into God bless, man. and raised 23 grand. And, and you made hundreds, thousands of hundreds of thousands off that movie, right? Oh, yeah. I'm freaking loaded. You were loaded off that one. That bought your first Ferrari, right? Yeah, exactly. No, it didn't. <laughs> didn't make a dime off it but i lost every penny we spent on Oof. it but i got to make a movie all right you know it was an experience and that changed every, just being able to say i made a movie i did it i learned what works I, you know being able to have your ass handed to you on a movie right out of film school is also an awesome learning experience too some, i mean that's a that's a ballsy move like you know it took look it took me it took me 20 years to make my first feature really yeah i mean i just finished it like last year yeah uh because i just didn't want to it, it's it, that was that mountain it's that so that's ma- what that it was. Fe- that feature film is that mountain. You and I climb. didn't. I didn't want to. I, I knew I just had to, 
I just had to get to the yeah, top so I could see the land. Yep. You know, and just get that out of the way. You're just like, it's, I don't care if it's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just going to make this feature, and I can just say I made a feature. Well, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, I had assumed that it would be a massive <laughs> Clerks, hit. of course, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, going to yeah. be clerks. It's, be, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be yeah. the next link later and sure, of course, so we all and so forth. And we, we know all how it's going to yes, yes. go from there. But, you know, reality set in. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I mean, look, taking a step back, I shot the movie. What'd you shoot on, by the way? 21 days on the red one. Okay. Rented it from a, a, a guy here in Los Angeles, friend of a friend, and flew him and I think eight other guys from USC down. We all lived on air mattresses in my parents' house. I had a letter from the mayor of Mishawaka, Indiana, that was essentially a gold key to do whatever we wanted for this production. To shoot wherever you want. Shoot wherever, whenever. I mean, we would have cops show up to set out of curiosity and then just offer help. You know, like, what can we do? Do we need to wrangle crowds? Just, it's it's just literally like it is shooting here in LA. It was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a family affair. It was awesome. That's awesome. Like, it was, it's such a small town. So of everyone course. knew the Dollies and yeah. I was into filmmaking and they were, we're making it's a something movie. that I yeah, had yeah, been yeah. made fun of for being into all those years. Yeah, sure. And everyone, you know, raised an eyebrow when I, got to tell them I'm moving to Los Angeles to pursue this. And they went, oh, he's not the weird kid. He's actually he's got real. a plan. Yeah, yeah, You know? And then to be able to come back and, you know, show them this letter and walk in with a crew oh, and yeah. say, we're doing it. Everyone went, okay, cool. What, what? How do we help? Yeah. And it it was an amazing experience. So we, we finished shooting and started calling friends around Los Angeles and said, I'm coming back to town. I just shot a movie. I need a place to live because if I stay home, I'll never make it back out there. Yeah, of course. You know, again, I've got like uh, 500 bucks left over from the film and spending cash. I'll, I'll crash on couches for now. And, uh, found Freddie Wong who was, you know, we were, we were friends in school. He said, look, I got a place. It's not pretty. You can stay here and it's cheap. Mm -hmm. I said, let's do it. I packed up my car. I drove out here. Uh, it was literally a, a mound of garbage mm -hmm. in this room. Uh, all concrete square space that was uh, built in an old paint factory down in East LA. Nothing completely inhabitable. You know, there but you guys were there. Bums dumpster diving outside my quote unquote bedroom window. Uh it was not pretty, but we were in LA, you know, and Man. I had two hard drives with a movie on it. <laughs> 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 so like I'm like, here we this like buckle down. Buckaroos, that's, like let's freaking do this. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's yeah. you know it's so it's so true because we both come from outside of L.A. We weren't born here. I know Matt was born here. <clears throat> I was not born yeah. here, but he lived here most. He's of his from life. Uh, Pasadena. Yeah, yeah, he's been here most of his life. But you know, I'm from Florida. You're from Indiana, and and it, you know, the, half the battle is just getting here. Yeah, and then the other half is staying here, surviving, mm -hmm. figuring a way to make a living. And just stay. And you could be in a rat infested place down in East LA, but you're here. Right. You can make that. You can go to that meeting. Yeah. You can you can show that movie in a place. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just getting here is the biggest mm -hmm. biggest thing. I, mean, I remember. <laughs> oh yeah, man! I was so excited to get into school out here, and I just it's going to change everything, and and it did. Um, but I remember when I first got to town, my mother drove with me. She came out with me. Oh yeah. She made the trip. Um, and the first thing we did after we moved everything into my dorm room, we were just sitting there on my little twin bed and she says, okay, so now we're here. You're moved in. What's the first thing you want to do in LA? And I said, we're going to Hollywood. Oh God. <laughs> uh, everyone does the damn same thing. I did it too yeah. when I got here. Let's go down to the walk of fame. Let's what a to, shit show. What an absolute, just a, a hot Dose of reality. Oh my God. Isn't, isn't, but listen, isn't Hollywood Boulevard the perfect analogy mm -hmm. for Hollywood and LA and the business as in general? Because on TV, when the Oscars are playing, they only show like the block and a half. The block and a half that's been carefully curated for that, two weeks leading up to the award. Correct. Show. Yeah. And that's it. But when you go down, I'll, and I'll tell you my quick Hollywood story mm -hmm. when I first got here, I, I, I'm coming here uh, visiting a friend. And we're like checking out places to my wife and I to live when mm -hmm. we're going to move. We came out like two or three times just to check neighborhoods and stuff. Yeah. So the first time we come out, he's like, we're like, hey, you know, we, we want to go see Hollywood. Right. And and exactly the same reaction both yep. you and I were like, oh, Jesus. 
Yep. All right. And he's like, all right, if you want to go, we'll go. So we went at night. Mm -hmm. Never forgot it. We parked right behind uh, Man's Chinese, whatever it's called now, but the Chinese Theater. Mm -hmm. We parked right on that little parking lot on the side of it. Uh, I think now is Madame Tussauds. <laughs> I think they yeah, built Madame, Madame Tussauds, Tussauds and it's there. like an AMC or something. It's still yeah. Man's, but it's like Man's AMC. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, but so anyway, we park there, and the second we get out the car, we turn around and we see this girl. I swear to God, this this you know some girl, and she's like, "Welcome to Hollywood," and flashes us, mm-hmm. literally in the parking lot. And my buddy just turns without skipping a beat, like, "Welcome to Hollywood." Yeah. And we walked it, and it's just the most disgusting. <laughs> you get those scummy freak shows in those nasty, oh, like, God. Elmo costumes, taking, hustling, extorting people out of money for photographs. It's, oh, it's, oh, God, yeah, 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 those guys. It's a hot dose of reality. It right? is. It really is. It really is. So let's get into, uh, you know, Rocket Jump. Okay. How the hell did a guy from Indiana right. and Freddie and Matt and all these guys just get together and start making short films and, and build this kind of Rocket Jump empire? Sure. Well, you know, those guys and I bonded because we all had similar, uh, I guess, backstories. You know, we all had similar upbringing and and association with film where we all experienced sort of backyard DIY filmmaking with your friends and your mm-hmm. brothers mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, so we, we bonded on that immediately. And obviously I moved in with Freddie out of film school and that's where I was putting my film together while I was – doing odds and end jobs, trying Mm -hmm. to make money. I remember before I'd gone to film school, I sold TVs back in Indiana. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll go back and get a job at Best Buy. (laughs) Boy, was that just a demoralizing thing to have to go sell cameras at an electronics retail store after you get out of this amazing film school, thinking (sighs) you're going to be whisked away into Hollywood uh, stardom. Oh no! I I lasted maybe a month before I. This is I can't. I would rather eat ramen, you know, yeah. and live dirt poor. Yeah, waiting for something better to come along. And I, I mean, I I did a lot of crap, edited a lot of garbage for actors. Um, it was all awful remedial work for nickels and dimes. And it was one of those film school connections. I had a friend from school, uh, a mutual friend of Freddie's that called me one day. She knew I was editing for folks and she called and said, look, I had an, I have an editor on this commercial and he called off sick today and the director needs somebody here. Can you be in Santa Monica in 45 minutes? And I said, you bet, you know, and I went and the director and I, Bonded, both being Midwest kids, mm-hmm. shared love for you know the thing and you know sure, sure, sure. eighties you know supernatural sci fi horror films, and I ended up sort of getting shepherd under his wing in the world of commercial editing and directing mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So I did that for for many years and started climbing the ranks relatively quickly in uh, the commercial business, which mm-hmm. was awesome. You know, mm-hmm. and it was again it all happened because some guy called off sick. And I had a connection to someone at USC. Yep. And I was ready. I Mm -hmm. was confident enough, having cut enough reels to say, I'll, I can do it. I'll figure it out. Um, so I learned a great deal from him and I was doing a lot of commercial work for the time. And, you know, in the meantime, Freddie had just started figuring out that YouTube was a thing. He had heard from folks that they were buying houses with YouTube money, you know? And I remember scoffing. I'm like, no, that's not okay. That's not Let the, me the, tell you about the concept of a film festival. And <laughs> here's how this works. And, you know, it, Freddie had been working sort of in that side of the business. He had been producing um, like direct DVD horror schlock, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which I got a kick out of. It's like some of my early jobs were cutting the behind the scenes special features for those movies that he was producing, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So we were all working together. And he said, I'm going to give this YouTube thing a try. Uh, and I remember, you know, Matt and I would be going off to our jobs. He was working at uh, Disney at the time in their uh, video game department. He was a, a video game producer. Mm-hmm. And Freddie started making short films around the office. And we were like, oh, oh my God, filmmaking? The whole reason why we came out here? Mm-hmm. Let's do that. So we would work together on things, you know, be in, be in Freddie's movies, hold a camera and a boom mic for Freddie because it, it was the thing that we all wanted to be doing anyway. Sure, sure. And – well, hell, if he if his first videos didn't start getting millions and millions of views, you know, I was incredulous at first, like this, this is impossible. How is this happening? This ha- it doesn't make sense, you know. And 
And and let's remind everybody, this time is what, 2000? This is 10, 11. 11, I think. About 11, 11 right? Yeah, 2011. So YouTube is basically five, six years old at that yeah. point. Google had already around. bought it. Google already bought it. Google had just bought it. Yeah, it's it was still niche. It was still small, and the quality still was eh. Yeah. It wasn't that great yet. But so everyone understands it what was, YouTube was. It was literally the advent of creators, you creators, know, a, a new batch of creators using it as a distribution platform. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And it was unheard of, you know, while everyone else, guys like me, thinking you have to, you know, schlep it through this, you know. This archaic system. This archaic system. You know, Freddie just recognized that with YouTube, you didn't have to. You could go shoot a movie for, you know, the cost of pizza and a case of water. And uh, it didn't like have a to two have. two-minute short. Yeah, it didn't have to be this $100,000, $200,000 short film to make it all this production value. You could just make something that's entertaining. Right. And that's all. Yeah, a lot of people were uploading home movies and stuff like that. Like that's what they yeah. thought YouTube was for. Right. And so for Freddie to be able to use just a, a little film school know-how and some After Effects, VFX wizardry, he could create, you know, really as far as everything else was on YouTube, just content that was light years beyond anything else you could find. Out. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, there wasn't there wasn't anybody really else doing what he was doing or what you guys were doing. In you know, there were other creators on there mm -hmm. expressing themselves yeah, uh, sure. with, a, with a touch of production value mm -hmm. that you weren't seeing on but YouTube nothing with as the a platform. But nothing with the VFX. F Freddie and... is a, you know, he's a VFX wizard. He was the guy in film school that we would go to because he knew After Effects. Right. You know, he did... He did title design and explosions and muzzle hits muzzle in flashes, all of yeah, our all, stuff, yeah. all of our videos in school. He was that guy. So, you know, he, he was into those movies and, you know, he's definitely a, a nerd in that respect. He knew After Effects. So, yeah, by, by, by nature, he could do things in his shorts that nobody else was capable of doing at that time. So yeah, was and it, it really stood out. So it was, again, you know, and, and we've had this conversation off, off air, but mm – -hmm. Rocket Jump's rise to fame and uh, is basically a good place of timing too. Oh yeah, it was yeah, right place, uh, right time. Yeah, no, that's uh, I don't I can't recall who said it to give them proper credit, but uh, luck is preparation meets opportunity. I, it, yeah, I don't know who said it either, but it yeah, it's true. That's it's all true. that it, it that's it. We were literally right place, right time. You know, with we, the right product, we had the we had the proper training, we had the ambition, we had the technical know how. We just didn't quite have the money and we were all stuck in these other jobs. And YouTube was paying creators through ad revenue. Uh, when you had to like – when you had to still apply for that, not, not automatic like it is now. Exactly. But yeah. Freddie got in because he had met folks through some other filmmaking competitions that were in YouTube and he spoke to the right people and they were going to allow him into the system to make some money off of YouTube ad revenue. And we saw that there was a platform – that there wasn't a lot of bureaucratic red tape like in a film. There was festival. none. There was zero. We yeah. could literally upload a thing complete to a mass control. of people, complete control, and make money. Just express ourselves, and then yeah, hopefully, at least cover the cost of the film itself. That was the goal, and that was uh, I think eclipsed pretty much. <laughs> you cover, yeah. you guys did better than just the four hundred dollars to three hundred dollars that it cost to make those movies. It was surprising how much money you could make off of YouTube in those days. It was like obscene, right? And then you guys also figured out not obscene, but you know, obscene in today's you know, just in general. Sure. Um uh I'll say this, it wasn't PewDiePie money or anything like that. No, I mean who I mean who, who makes PewDiePie money? Yeah. But uh but no, but still it was it was more than three hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. It was it was it be it got to a point where a job. So you, you, to bring it back to your original question, like what was Rocket Jump, it, it it ballooned very quickly past the point of it just covering the cost of the film itself. Mm -hmm. And we started to see, OK, we can actually pay ourselves for the labor. We're starting to earn, I, you know, I, I sort of loosely in quotes, a living out of doing this. Yeah. This isn't necessarily the end game, but this is a means and it's providing us with an outlet. We can actually afford to go out to dinner and talk about what movie we're going to do next. So there's a lot of excitement. You were there. basically getting paid to be filmmakers. Yeah. Which and is, nobody gets to do th that. Is that is the dream. That's the dream. That's the dream. And to be able to literally 
fall into that fucking ass first right out of college is absolutely insane. It was you know, again exactly like um, I always tell people like being right place at the right time. I mean, you know, if El Mariachi shows up today, it doesn't hit. No. If Clerks shows up today, it doesn't hit. No. Y- you know. Now if Reservoir Dogs comes today, it hits. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. You know, but yeah. that's a different. Yeah. But that's a different conversation. But generally speaking, right place, right time. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and that's what you guys did, and it's fascinating. And the basic concept here, guys, who's listen, whoever's listening to this podcast right now, is you're being paid to be a filmmaker. We were professionals. You were professional. We, well, I would say we were professional amateurs. <laughs> you were professional amateurs or being, amateur professionals. I'm not sure. Being paid to be filmmakers in a new. I guess I, I hate to use the word genre, but in a new yeah, it was all it's all new. It it's all, still all new. It was all I would definitely say genre. I mean, we weren't doing dramatic stuff. They were all action concepts. A lot of it was birthed out of um, uh, there was there was a guy Andrew Kramer. You mm-hmm. aware of Andrew Kramer? The name's uh, Video good. Copilot. Yeah, yeah. And he was putting out these really cool oh, After yeah. Effects tutorials. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we would watch these After Effects tutorials, you know, and just consume how you. Do these the, create these illusions in a computer for basically zero dollars and cents, and you could reverse engineer an idea out of that. Be like, oh, okay, well, so we can create a shockwave in the course of a day. All right, so what would be a cool idea? You know, focused around a shockwave, and you reverse engineer from a cool Off the effect, effect, and you wrote a story around. And the you could write a little story around. Okay, so it's like you, you know, again, this came down to ba- our backyard filmmaking day. So it's like, all right, we've got an al- an industrial looking alley in East LA. We've got one shitty car. We've got one camera, one mic, 40 bucks, and a uh, shockwave effect. You know, uh, Freddie will be in it, of course. We've got one actor. If everyone else is holding a mic or a camera, uh-huh. Uh-huh. okay, we've literally left with a Freddie. That's the box. You know, how do you fill that? So it was all out of necessity, mm-hmm. you know, all experimentation, or at least early on. Well, it was always experimentation, but. It's amazing how relatively quickly it became a business, mm-hmm. you know? Um, there was money to be made there, and we saw something bigger than just YouTube filmmaking. We saw that, okay, this is a means to an end. We can potentially open up doors here. You know, there's agents reaching out to us, managers reaching out to us. Maybe we can, if we can keep this going, we'll build an audience, and that, the building, like, Fostering an audience of people gets us meetings, and then we can talk about maybe in the future one day doing a Marvel movie or something like that. So, what, in your opinion, because you, I mean, you're the perfect person to ask this question about because you have uh, one foot in both camps. Mm -hmm. You have one in the old way of doing things, and it's still very much the standard way of doing things, which is the normal you make your independent film, you go to the festivals, Mm -hmm. you get seen, or you make a short film, you get an agent, and that gets you a job and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You have your foot in that that sandbox, but you also have your foot in the digital world. So you're not one or the other. You don't live in one or the other. You live in both. Yeah. And you come from both. So the way the world has shifted so much uh, recently, in the last five years even, what's your take on the whole shift of where things you think are going because you know i've i just finished my feature i've gone down the festival route mm-hmm. and i'm gonna do you know, we're gonna do streaming we'll do itunes all that kind of stuff and we'll yeah. see if we make some money with it um but part of me wonders like well maybe i should have just put it out on not youtube but like amazon prime or something like that sure. to see if i can generate some revenue off of it what's the where do you think all this is going i have i have mixed emotions mm-hmm. um I mean, look, I make no bones about it. If if the business hadn't changed when it did, I wouldn't have a TV show on Hulu right now. Right. You know? Oh, no, I'd, st- I'd still be bundling cable. Um, so, it, I mean, it created so many opportunities for us. There is a credibility that you get taking the tra- quote-unquote traditional or rather old-school route mm-hmm. that you don't get in this digital space. Now, Yet. Yet, it's I would I would say there's a type there's a specific type of credibility that we've garnered mm-hmm. doing things the way we have, mm-hmm. which has certainly got the attention of mainstream, mainstream. media, mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. traditional folks, but they still kind of look at us side eyed. It's not I taken one hundred percent serious yet, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're certainly hoping with Dimension Four Hundred Four that we approached with a more ambitious, quote unquote, traditional mentality that mm-hmm. we can change that perspective a little bit. 
But I mean, I don't know. Like, part of me would love to go uh, as a next project, go get a few hundred thousand dollars and go make a in any movie, in any movie like the Puffy Chair or something, you know, sure, sure, and, you know, sure, and sure. just and just tour around, take it to festivals, just because that's again that was also a dream of mine to be able to do that and just experience what that feels like, good, bad, or indifferent, you mm-hmm. know. Um, it's it's fun. I, yeah. yeah, I've gone through that. Right, I've gone through it. It's fun. It's a it's a, it's wonderful, but. You're coming from a different perspective because you've already achieved a, a, That's fair. a, a success yeah. from where you're coming from. So now you're kind of going through this other – like I love to feel what it's like to go and run at a festival. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Walk the red carpet at a festival with a movie that I'm doing and they're going to show it on the big screen right. and stuff like that. Right. That whole process. Right. Uh, and I've done that multiple times with my projects, and it's wonderful. But I want to go down the path you're walking down and see how that feels. Like, wow, mm-hmm. imagine just putting out a video and you've got two million people watched it. Right. Like, that's an experience that I've never had. It's weird. It's um, it, what, yeah. How is that experience? Like, when you have something that just it's just shows it could up. Be, oh, it, it's a it's a gift and a curse. It, it's it, the, you know the pros and cons. Mm-hmm. There's it, look. You want to know how your art is perceived, mm-hmm. you know? And the internet's very kind and gentle that way. And it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and specifically in regards to filmmaking, it is it is a shared experience, or at least that's the way I view it. You yeah, know? sure. I, I think it's the reason why we keep coming back to the, you know, proverbial campfire after right. millennia. Mm-hmm. There's something about that shared experience, experiencing that art together. And as a filmmaker, you want to see how people perceive your work. So being able to literally click a button and get instant feedback on YouTube is incredibly gratifying. Amazing. Also, fucking horrifying. <laughs> the people on there are a special breed. They're brutal. Yeah, brutal. Right. Man. And, and I would rather the most cynical group of people. Un- I, I love them. To it, death. It's weird. I, I tend to stay away from that now. You know. So yeah, it's yeah. like you have the ability to put something out and get that feedback, but you have to stay away from it because it will drive you absolutely crazy. Oh, I know. I was, with oh, the, yeah. with this sh- with dropping a show on Hulu is the complete opposite of a festival affair in that there was no screening. We didn't have the cast and crew together to watch it on the big screen mm-hmm. to be able to hear the laughs or, or or the cringing uncomfortability, the shifting of seats when something there's a lot of tension on screen mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. even if something isn't working, you get that immediate feedback. This show just dropped at midnight, uh, and I'm at home alone on the couch, you know, so zero feedback, which it's very different from it's anticlimactic the the, the YouTube thing, that, yeah. you know, using YouTube as a platform. So sure. That's why I would, no I would love to experience that, you know. I, we'll, and like we've talked, we'll definitely have a, a screening here in L.A. Just sure. so we can all very selfishly <laughs> stroke one another's egos and, and have the feeling of watching our thing communally sure. on a big sure, screen. Sure, 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 you know? sure. That, um, now, look, how do you go from making YouTube videos, funny little YouTube videos, to working for Hulu and Lionsgate? Sure. And working them as partners. How uh, is that transition? Because there's a yeah. lot of guys on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Who make their little short films and make videos, but have not been able to make that jump. And you guys have done it in a very unique way with video school, uh, video game high school. school. That was it. That was the that was the sort of Rosetta Stone, Mm -hmm. um, a bridge for us. Uh, Again, I I can never give Freddie enough credit, and especially my my partner Matt. Those guys very early on realized that that could be an issue, a perceived issue of value. If these guys are just short filmmakers, why should we talk to them about making long form content? And I, I'd be curious to talk to Freddie more about where exactly that came from. That if he was just sort of this digital Oracle. Nostradamus, if you will, Oracle, or yeah. I, I bet a lot of it has to do with some of the meetings we were getting at that time. Mm-hmm. Folks curious to meet with us for say, you know, like a Guardians of the Galaxy type film, and there not being enough of. Uh, product that demonstrates we could pull that off so you know the short version was we we agreed okay we got to prove that we can do long form narrative we got shorts in the bag how do we do long form narrative let's do a web series and um uh, well it, it, kickstarter was a thing that had just happened at the time mm-hmm. and we figured boy okay we love the creative control that we have in youtube videos when we fund everything ourselves how do we translate that into a much higher budget web series? And, you know, we were very lucky in the, that we had at the time um, the highest or I guess most successful film Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you know, people were just into Again, it. Again, right place, right time. Yeah, right place, right time. Kickstarter was new. People were loving the YouTube channel. Uh, the nexus of perfect timing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got the cash, and it, uh, that a lot of that, the credit for that show comes down to the writing. You know, and specifically Matt Arnold and um, Will Campos and Brian Frenzy, who were the writers on that series, put a lot of work in a narrative. Um, we knew that that was our shot to prove that we could do that. And and you released it straight to, to YouTube. We released it straight to YouTube. Because you it was already funded already. So you basically had no out of pocket no out of pocket costs. And you were basically just paying back everybody by just showing it. And there weren't really a lot of options either to, to make money. There wasn't a, a lot of streaming options. Like you couldn't have put it on Amazon Video Direct and start, you know, charging three ninety nine or iTunes wasn't really a thing as much back then. Oh no. I mean or, look, our me, audience was our audience was YouTube. expecting free content. Right. We had an audience on YouTube, right? Yeah. So yeah. yes, if we want to make something bigger and better for them. We weren't ready to ask them to follow hey, us somewhere else. Sure. Let so alone live, pay for it. So you have to live there. Gotcha. So in a way, we did ask them to pay for it by right. kickstarting it. Of course. Um, and just letting them know like, yeah, you're not paying for the film. You're supporting this effort and mm -hmm. you're part of it. You know, mm -hmm. it was a we, – we really – sold the the communal aspect that sure. we can't do this without you guys mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and then yeah like look it, it hit that first season went gangbusters i think it got like 50 million views or something mm -hmm. stupid like that and uh you know just got to work on a second season and a second season we said okay so how do we take this a step further let's try to follow a more traditional 22 minute television format so the first season episode length varied um from I, I don't know maybe the shortest was around 16 minutes and then the longest was 40 something the finale oh, Jesus, is like you were all over 40 the minutes they're all over the place yeah, you know yeah, yeah. The, the, the cool thing about youtube and being our own you know distributor was that the length of the content was dictated by you know the narrative but then we realized okay well let's take an opportunity though to prove that we can do a traditional tv format with the second season so they were 22s uh, and then same with the third season, but then some got longer as, the, <laughs> you know, as the season went on, your finale was nearly an hour long and stuff. Sure. Like that. Sure. Special, special episodes. Exactly. Yeah. But there were, you know, to make a long story short, there were a couple people in the industry, younger guys, you know, around my age who mm -hmm. were looking for new emerging talent to full, bring into the studio system, to introduce, to everyone and they saw what we were doing with that series and they recognized that there was potential. You know, we were again at the time there wasn't anyone else doing long form content. You know, we had inspired this movement of creators on YouTube to throw up short films mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But we were the only guys who were mimicking a traditional television format. And the studio system said Oh, okay. So much like music video directors in the '90s, there's something going on over here. We should take a look at. And I think that's what allowed us to get meetings over maybe even other way more talented folks on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Is because we demonstrated an ability to craft a long form narrative. And and also, you guys had the very strategic ability to understand your audience. Like you didn't go make Downton Abbey. Like you made video game high school because you know that was the crowd that you had as yes. your audience. It was that you know Matt always tells the story a little better than I do. Or actually, Will does. But the name for it came from Will, and another friend of ours, Chris. They were, a, they were on a road trip once. We were talking about the idea of doing something longer. What could it be? What would the audience like? And the joke was, well, the most knowing those people, the most pandery thing we could do <laughs> would be a silly show called Video Game High School, you know, where it's those those kids literally in a high school of an alternate future playing video games to become professionals. And that was just a joke. Like, wouldn't they go nuts for that? And, you know, to, to Matt and Freddie's credit, they went, oh, I think there's something there. You know, like then, yeah. maybe if we approach this with sincerity, mm -hmm. um, we'll do it. And, and, you know, and I think to our credit to self-analyze a little bit because we've made mistakes in in, in misunderstanding the audience um, and coming to incorrect conclusions about what they want uh, and what they're looking for. And for us, it always just came back to making stuff that we wanted to watch. You know, Video Game High School was literally that show got made 
because Matt Arnold said, I would pay to see this. So I'm going to take up the mantle as showrunner and we're going to make this happen. And we all went, okay, this guy's passionate about this. Let's make it work. You know, Dimension 404 is very similar in that respect. It was a natural extension of us mm-hmm. doing short films mm-hmm. and then sort of webisodes. Mm-hmm. And we just thought, well, hell, there's a total vacuum of anthology television at this time, mm-hmm. you know, when we were developing years ago. And we said, we would all pay to see this. This is something we're really passionate about. Mm-hmm. Is the audience going to like it? Well, if it's something that we love and we're passionate about and we're giving it at our all, it will, it will, by extension, find an audience. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And that's what we were more attracted to. Now, can you give any advice about how to build an audience? Because I think that is the key moving forward, I think, as filmmakers in the future. Like sure. it's, it's about niche. It's not about trying to hit the mass market. It's going to be about finding that audience and feeding the audience that you can attract. Sure. Well, in the earlier days, a lot of it came down to consistency, quality, communication, transparency. We were, we treated it like a business. We treated the audience with respect, you know? So very much like, okay, so we're fans of comic books when we were kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I get a comic book every every week or so. There's a new issue, yeah. okay? Yeah. And I know what the story is going to be. I know when I'm going to get it. And I know there's going to be a certain quality that I can ex- expect from it. And, you know, the same goes for television. And that's the way we treated the YouTube channel. So even though we were completely independent amateur knuckleheads making mm-hmm. you know YouTube videos on the cheap. We treated it professionally. We knew there had to be a certain level of quality. It had to hit every Tuesday at 2 p.m. People could expect to know what type of content it was going to be. It all fit within this sort of genre Venn diagram. So it's not like we would throw out action one week and then sincere me- melodrama the next. <laughs> right. Yeah. You it was know, a brand. Like, it, was a, great... it, was, it was branding. Yeah. That's what it was. And then at the time, a lot, a, a lot of benefit came out of running the second channel, which is very transparent and specifically a, a, a community building effort where we sort of removed the corporate mask and it was, hey, look, it's just us. It was, you know, proto blogging in mm-hmm. essence, you know, or vlogging rather, mm-hmm. you know, most often it was Freddie in front of a camera. A lot of behind the scenes content, like look how much fun we're making this stuff, and we're doing it for you guys. Thankful that you love it. Here's where you can go see more. And then furthermore, let's take it an extra step and let's show you how we do this stuff. If you're into this, like we were when we were your age, here's how we put it together. You know, and so we were sort of giving back in a digital way what we got from all those DVD special features and stuff mm-hmm. like that when we were kids. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think we were all just, because we were such nerds for that stuff. We wanted to be able to. Say, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, it just it feels cool to be able to share that with folks. Oh, yeah, you know? I know. And just bringing them in on that action rather than treating it like some sort of corporate entity. Mm-hmm. They, I don't know, everyone just said, okay, these are real people. This isn't just a brand. There are dudes behind this. Um, it was reverse engineered in that way. It was, it started it was originally behind a person and personalities before we slowly introduced the concept of a brand around it as opposed to, trying to personalize uh, right. a corporation. You're trying sense. to make you're trying to make a a human connection. Absolutely. As opposed to like, you know, Disney. We are yeah. we are artists, you know, and creators mm-hmm. and we are making stuff that we're passionate about for people that want to see cool stuff as opposed to we are a, a brand that makes X product, here's why product is good for you, you know? Got it, got it. So let's let's get let's get down to D D404. Okay. You mentioned 404. Yeah. How, how did it come to to be uh, it's by far the biggest thing you guys have ever undertaken, ambitiously and budgetarily. Yeah. <laughs> everything. Yeah. Uh, Much to the studio's chagrin. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did that come to be? And um, and you're the showrunner of it. So mm-hmm. how does that feel? Because I know I know a little bit of how you what you've gone through. Sure. But we could talk about that in a minute. Uh, showrunning is is it's uh, a horrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it is an awful, thankless, <laughs> thankless evil. Nasty job, uh, <laughs> but an honorable one. Sure. Um, and it feels good. I'm proud of what we were able to pull together. Where did it start? Well, after season one of Video Game High School, mm-hmm. you know, we successfully distributed that first season and we thought, okay, so we know we'll do a second season. Is there anything else we can develop? 
and our friends from here yet again, USC, uh, Will Campos, Dan Johnson, David Welch said, we'd love to do an anthology show and we have an idea for like a hook for one and a really cool title called Dimension 404. And here's a short, uh, short script for an episode. And we can do these as a, another web series, just like Video Game High School. We'll just release episodes on YouTube. We can do them on the cheap. And I, what was it? What was that script? Was that one of the scripts it was, I made? It? it was Kronos. Oh, okay. Um, God, how could it you was do called, Kronos on the cheap? <laughs> I know. It was, and this was before we had to change his name for legal reasons. It was called Captain Kronos in the Time Teens. Okay. Before we had to change it to uh, Time Rider in the Chrono Teens. Uh-huh. Captain Kronos is actually a name owned by Marvel. Captain we, Kronos is owned. When by we went Marvel? through the funny, funny quick tangent here is when we went through the clearance process, we discovered that Marvel literally trademarked every possible cool superhero name ever ever even if they don't use it you should see the rolodex of names for comics that they've never created excuse me is insane wow so anyway they had a script it was i think 12 pages long 8 to 12 pages long it was just a little web uh mm-hmm. webisode mm-hmm. um but i was i mean got my favorite anthology film is uh Creep show, and I grew up on Twilight Zone reruns. Amazing Those stories, my, my sure. amazing stories. Yeah, Outer Limits. Those were my dad's favorite TV shows. Mm-hmm. So we would watch, you know, bootleg videotapes of that stuff when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So they presented the idea of doing an anthology show, which was uh, an extension of what we were doing, it, shorts and webisodes. Anyhow, so my little light bulb went off, and I said, "Yeah, this is something I can see myself getting passionate about. Let's let's talk more." And we slowly started the, you know, spinning the development wheels at Rocket Show. Um, fast forwarding some time, it evolved from a web series to uh, a television show. And that's around the time we got involved with Lionsgate. And we mm-hmm. signed an overhead deal with them. Again, based upon what we were able to do with Video Game High School, there's an executive over there who said, you know what, I, I think you guys, uh, above a lot of other folks we've seen on the YouTube platform, the, the, the digital space in general, you've demonstrated you can do long-form narrative. Let's talk. What, what do you want to do? And we pitched Dimension 404 as something we were going to do as a web series. And they went, no, you're selling yourself short. We can sell this as a television show. You know, we bought, this is what we do. We've got a television department. Uh, let's go make it a show. Can you make it a show? We said, yeah, well, yeah. of course yeah, we can. Well, yeah, we can do anything, you know? Sure. Um, and it was originally being developed because they were shorts. We said, well, there'll be a half hour show. Um, and then the economics start to get involved. Mm-hmm. And well, I guess... In place of that. So I'm jumping ahead. The studio said, okay, so why don't you guys develop that? Let's get some finished scripts and we'll take it around and pitch it to folks. Try to find a distribution partner. Uh, do you have anything else? And we pitched Rocket Jump the show, mm-hmm. um, which was something that didn't require as much development and was a true uh, extension of our uh, creating short films. And they said, we can go do this right now. You know, so we we walked over to Hulu, who they were very friendly with, and Hulu loved the idea, and we went right to production into that while we were simultaneously developing Dimension Four Hundred Four. Um, so we already had a partnership with Hulu, um, very fruitful partnership. Those guys are uh, excellent collaborators. Mm-hmm. I have only yeah. you know the utmost respect for them. Yeah, I, I've heard from I've heard people who work with Netflix mm-hmm. and Hulu and even Amazon. It's it's a completely different experience than working with a traditional studio. Like they just kind of let you go for a lot. You know, I've never really been in in a traditional quote unquote studio environment, so I sure. can't say. All I know is that yeah, they gave us the freedom on that first show to do whatever we wanted. You know, um, and same thing, good with- or bad. And the same thing with Dimension Four Hundred Four. Yeah. You know, so we had that one show going. We were developing Dimension Four Hundred Four. The studio calls and says. Okay, well, you know, we're looking at the economics here, and we think uh, this might be better served as an hour-long show. Uh, and at first, we were hesitant. We're like, okay, I don't know, this feels weird. Why do we keep changing the format? And then when the writers and I, you know, super talented writers, again, the guys who came up with the original title for the show, Dan, mm-hmm. David, Will, and then of course, um, uh, my friend from Ruby Dog Films, Jake Andrews, and Catherine mm-hmm. Garcia, mm-hmm. Um, we all said, you know what, there's something to this. We have to change the format of the episodes, but this is really liberating having an extra 20 minutes. We can explore more advanced uh, character arcs. Mm-hmm. We can, we can, we don't, we're not building to a twist ending. We can open with a twist ending, or we can have a twist ending even come at your second act low point. Mm-hmm. 
and then really take off and see where it evolves from there. Like imagine an episode of Twilight Zone where you get to the twist ending. Mm -hmm. And then there's another 22 minutes where you explore how that character deals with their sure. new set of circumstances. Sure, sure, sure. And we thought, okay, now that's it just like something yeah. that we can use to yeah. distance ourselves from those other shows. Because there's always a fear of ours that we are going to be – it's it's funny in hindsight. We're always afraid everyone's going to say you're just a derivative of Twilight Zone mm -hmm. instead of doing your own thing. Now, unfortunately, everyone's saying – Black Mirror this, Black Mirror that. Yeah, yeah. And for the record, listeners, we had developed this show before Black Mirror was ever premiered. So yes. I, don't, I don't want to hear it. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But, even Black, Mirror, but Black Mirror is a completely different show than D4. Or I think or. if you've seen both, it's yeah, quite obvious. It's completely different. We were we were terrified when we heard this thing called Black Mirror is coming out and we saw the first episodes and we loved them, but we sighed relief yeah. knowing, oh, okay, this is its own. This is not us. We I grew up in the Sam Raimi camp and I wanted it to be that spook -a blast theme park ride of a show. I wanted mm -hmm. it to be fun, funny, weird, pulpy. Just pure genre entertainment. Now that said, we wanted it to still have a message and a theme and to mm -hmm. say something about mm -hmm. the world that we live in, but it wasn't about and – And you do, sir. It wasn't about techno yeah. fears and anxiety like some of those other shows. You sure, know? Sure, we sure. wanted it to be an adventure – thrilling adventure hour basically. And, 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 and you know, after you – know, I've been so blessed to work with you guys on this project I, and it just came – it's right up my alley. And it's from the same, like, you know, it's the same school. Like, if you and I lived a block from each other, we probably would have been making movies and hanging a good time yeah. back in the day. So that, because it's exactly the kind of movie, the kind of show that I would watch. And it's, it's so much fun and just, like you said, pulpy mm -hmm. and, and kind of quirky. Yeah. And you kind of get away with stuff because of that, too. You're just like, <sighs> yeah, I'm just having a good time. No, I mean, it's what it, it, things really came together when we settled on the hour long format because then we realized, okay, we're not. We're not doing Twilight Zone. We're literally doing mini movies. Every this is event television. Is, yeah. Every week, more like Amazing Stories. Every week is its own mini piece of cinema. Uh, really ambitious stories with a high concept sci-fi hook, and they're all about something. And yeah, you know, all, every writer there was a shared love for genre, but everyone had their own influences mm -hmm. that they wore on their sleeve, mm -hmm. and that's why these episodes. That's why the, the show really took on the quality of it being a series of small films as opposed to something, I don't know, perhaps a little more thematically cohesive mm -hmm. than it is. It's definitely mm -hmm. a mixed bag, but. Oh, yeah. That's why I love about it, though. Right. Well, like Amazing Stories, too. Yeah. Amazing Stories was, I mean, they were all pretty much a mixed bag. Yeah. Like one week you have. Well, that's the, that's the fun of anthology. You yeah. know, there's a little something for everyone. And again, that's why we got excited as filmmakers because mm -hmm. we all knew. All right, there's going to be something that Des is passionate about writing, sure, directing, sure, 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 sure. Matt, you know, and Freddie, and then we'll bring other people in to do stuff that they're really excited about. And hopefully, if we get a chance to do second, third, fourth, fifth seasons, we can bring in other cool filmmakers, maybe people that we admire to come in and work in the, sure. in the quote unquote digital space and let them do their thing. So there's just a, a lot of potential and opportunity there. Right. That we're really right. excited about. Now, what is the biggest lesson you learned on D404? The biggest lesson I learned. Oh, uh, man. I don't know if it was a new lesson, but you're constantly reminded how hard filmmaking is. <laughs> even with all the tech, even man. with all the, the resources you guys have, it's Getting still... more money than we've ever used, you know, ever had access to before. It never gets any easier. Ever, ever, ever. And you always think that, okay, on this next project, because it's it's one step higher in the echelon of where I'm trying to get. You'll coast. It'll be able to it'll, get, yeah, we'll be able to coast a little more. And it only gets harder, you know? Because you get more ambitious. You get more ambitious. We're always constantly trying to push the envelope. And yeah, Jesus, man, it is hard. It was really hard putting the show together. It was certainly a hell of, it, it, should have been a lot more expensive than it was. We did oh, this for God. nickels and dimes. Oh, you know, no. you know the budget. You know where you're getting paid. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no question. Uh, and and look, how many visual effects shots were there? Fourteen hundred. Uh, if you include what we did here in the office, yeah, roughly around sixteen hundred. It is on par with the same amount of VFX shot in Rogue, Rogue One. Right, right, yeah. And to do that many VFX shots at the quality you guys did it on because the quality we is, didn't is... want it to look look that was I said that I you know from day one when I spoke with the VFX vendors and then we settled with our good friends at Playfight mm -hmm. 
we don't want it to be TV quality VFX. No, 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 no. And they aren't. It should be cinema quality VFX. You know, we didn't want this to look like television. Yeah, and 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 you achieved that without question. It's at times, <laughs> at times, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and and, and uh, I personally inserted every single one of those VFX shots in that all, all sixteen hundred, all so. sixteen hundred of those goddamn shots. I put into each episode. So yeah, you know, those uh, guys did great, didn't they? Oh my god, the VFX that kept coming in, like, uh, well, when we did Cinethrax, yeah. And Polybius. Those are the two. Those are my two favorites, by the way. I know you directed both of them. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not kissing your ass. They're two of my favorites of you the show. My, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah. Well, that's how it works here in Hollywood. You gotta, <laughs> yeah. Gotta, a little, you gotta a, a little smooch every once in a while. A little smooch every <laughs> once in a while. That never hurts. Yeah. No, but in all honesty, because they're, they're more of my sensibility uh, and Cinethrax and specifically Polybius, when I, I, was, way, I was dying because I had the offline. Yeah. For weeks, right. and I'm watching it. I'm like, and Will, Will, our uh, the post soup on this. He kept telling me he's like, oh, they're coming, and they look great because it was the monster and all right. this kind of stuff. Uh, it's and the I, meat, and and uh, a lot, none of it's it. really superfluous. We always everything we do has to tie back to story and character, right? Um, but boy, it was really look flat out disheartening. Nothing. There's it's your film is never as awful as that first assembly. Oh God! And I remember how crushed I felt. I mean, completely defeated and like an epic failure when we saw those first assemblies of the episodes. And you know, that's just that's the that's nature the of how, that's the process. But especially I, when there's so many VFX, you have no, you can't. It's hard to even imagine. You know, but that's how it is. To I mean, to answer your your question, how is it never not surprising? Every time you you get through <laughs> every stage, you go. I've I've lived this a hundred times now. And every time you're you're pre- you're never prepared for how awful that first assembly is, yeah. or how awful your your first I don't know sound design passes or your color pass or yeah. whatever you know it's always like oh shoot that's not what I was expecting that's not what I pictured in my mind's eye okay but let's roll up our sleeves and get into this you know mm-hmm. how do we work with this and look I gotta say despite all the those negative aspects of being sort of caught off guard as you're sort of, you know, slugging your way through an ambitious low budget project like this. I'm always constantly surprised as well at how amazingly the things come together mm-hmm. in those last couple steps when you get the final oh, the effects. That's where the I live. Sound, that's the where color. I live. Yeah. You it's a little easier for you. Because I live at that you get to see all the pieces come together in the final stage, you know? You know, sometimes I'll be honest with you. Like throughout the entire process, I rarely watch the shows until the final online. With really, you. like I, I I've seen every shot a thousand yeah. times. But I usually don't have the audio on. Uh, so like a lot of times, I'd ask you, I'm like, so what? Ha- Do you remember when you yeah. watched it? Like, so what? Why is she doing that? And who's and you, and you look at me like, didn't you? I'm like, no, I haven't. I just wait till everything's in before yeah. I watch it. So when I watch that final on, like, like I still haven't seen Impulse. Fully yet with That's all the hilarious. Audio, with the full input because I've I've watched the whole show a thousand times because yeah. I've had to for right. online right but I haven't heard it so now I'm like oh, okay and then when the second I start hearing stuff I'm like oh that makes so much more sense <laughs> <laughs> good I'm glad I'm glad this to have all that works so much better it's now actually, you know what it's actually quite nice to have a set of fresh eyes that late in the game That's really no nice. it really yeah I try to do that I try yeah. to, so when I color something I generally don't watch the movie uh you know unless it's something specific yeah. that's just my process yeah but at least I'll just I'll just look at it completely yeah fresh but that's i didn't know if you knew that or not but that's how i that's I, how I had a sense yeah <laughs> i had just, a sense <laughs> I, I wait for the vfx and all that stuff to come yeah, in man the vfx look great it, it, this is the first um look i've made a, a billion short films and web mm-hmm. series mm-hmm. and worked in commercials and i've done a lot not a whole lot yet you know like i, I feel like i'm just at the very beginning of my what sure. i hope to be a long career sure sure um but boy, was it is it fun watching these episodes finished? You know, so I can <sighs> it's I giving birth. I always find it difficult. Mm-hmm. I feel like learning the craft of filmmaking has, in many respects, ruined watching films for me. Oh, it which does, before yeah. having a love for filmmaking, that was my favorite thing to do. You know, watching yeah. movies, and you know, just knowing, <sighs> seeing behind the curtain spoils that. But occasionally, once in a blue moon, you get that movie that you forget, and you get so caught into you're, it, you're chasing that high. You you look for that high, like yeah. you just completely forget about the process. You forget about the lighting. You forget about the VFX, and right. you're just there. Right. That moment when you saw Star Wars for the first time. Right. That's what you keep. That high is what we chase. Yeah. Thing. Or the, American Werewolf. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. One of those. One of those movies. Yeah. So I've got uh, a couple more questions before we go because it's been going on for a little bit. But okay. I have a couple, few more questions I always ask everybody. But yeah. Specifically, the last question I, I wanted to ask you. 
is if you were going to start building an online audience today yeah. from scratch, right? what do you do? What do you do? And I'm not saying YouTube. I'm just saying audience in any shape or form, yeah. podcasting, website, blog, sure, 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 sure. anything. Okay, look. Well, you, you first have to figure out what it is you want to share with this audience. What product are you delivering to them? Is it film? Is it music? Is it your your personality and your critique in the way of some sort of blog or vlog or what have you? You know, what is it that you're going to be creating? What are you passionate about? Where is your particular skill set? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, precisely which niche that falls into. Mm -hmm. And so you can target yourself at a specific audience. And I think it's really important for folks to ask themselves, you know, what it is they're passionate about. Because you got to be making something for yourself. And that's what people are going to be drawn to. As There's a lot of folks out there who I think chasing the wrong end of that stick. You know, if they chase them, if you chase it for the money, you, it's you're chasing it for the money, or you're just thinking, okay, I'll just do what somebody else. I'll just replicate the Mm-mm. process, Mm-mm. you know, as mm-hmm. opposed to actually having, you know, passion for something. Like, you know, I wouldn't do it if you think you're going to get rich off of it because it's nothing. Nothing's you're not going to necessarily. <laughs> you're almost definitely not going to get. If rich you go off into it with something. that mentality, you definitely won't. No, man, it's not going to happen. I'll also say, don't say anything racist. <laughs> don't say anything racist on the internet ever. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but again, it comes down to creating quality content, something that you're passionate about, and tying yourself. You know, finding a platform where the community can, where a community who's into that kind of thing yeah. can very easily find it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got to be of quality. Keep your content consistent. Mm-hmm. You know. Give the folks what they want. They're not going to come back if it's sporadic or they don't know if uh, it's when the next thing is going to drop. You know, Be transparent with these folks. Let them know a little bit more about your personality. People don't want to subscribe to brands. They want to be inspired by artists, You know, people with unique personalities. So I, I think people need to be self-reflexive, ask themselves, self-evaluate, you know, what makes my perspective unique and what do I have to offer? Is it something new? And if it's not something new, maybe you should take a a hard look at that being a road you actually want to go down, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's where it's got to start, man. It's got to start with you, yourself, and I, you know? What are you into? Now, do you agree with the statement that any kind of audience building is a long game? It is not a short game. Meaning that it's going to take absolutely. time. No, absolutely. There are exceptions to that rule. But of course. They are few and far between. Right. Yeah. The lottery tickets. The, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the, the reality is the rest of us have to play that long game. Yeah. Because it took you – it didn't – I mean, Rocket Jump didn't just take off in – Five months, or it took a little bit. It, it was it was fast, but it was it did take time, and to build it to where it is today, that took years. It took many many years, and it, and it will and it will constantly be that way. You know, as your audience grows, tastes change. As our tastes as filmmakers and our goals and ambitions mm-hmm. change, we're going to be appealing to a slightly different subset of that audience, or perhaps a whole new audience in general. You know. Uh, the original audience was built around us making short action VFX videos. So if I want to go off and do a drama, uh, which I may very well want to do at some point in my career, I have to start thinking ahead of how do I how do I broach that with my current audience? Do I need to build a new audience? How can I extend the boundaries of the folks I currently produce content? I don't even want to say content. I hate that. I hate mm-hmm. when people throw that around like, like we're just making a product, you know? Right, right. Art, there's, art. Our art. We're making art, but we have to be real in that there's there, there's the whole commerce mm-hmm. flip side to this it, coin. It the, is a business. The, the, the word business has twice as many letters as the word show. Absolutely. And my friend Susan Lyon said that. I was like, yeah, that's that's awesome. You know, and I think that's what a lot of <laughs> folks uh, fail to realize. You're building something like this on your own is that it is a combination of art and commerce, you know? Like, you can't have one without the other. I think a lot of folks are really – talented artistically and have something unique to say, Mm -hmm. but they don't take the necessary steps to keep it uh, at a certain quality, keep it consistent, you know, reach out to folks in a professional manner. 
Uh, and then vice versa. You got a lot of folks who sort of break down this, the successful strategies of building an online social presence, mm -hmm. but they don't have anything unique to say. <laughs> right. They're not necessarily artistically inclined in any Correct. way, shape, or form. They understand so, SEO, but that's pretty much it. That's, you know, <laughs> but it's if you look back to the fundamentals of filmmaking, you have directors meeting, you know, their perfect producing partner and you oh, have that combination. You yeah. have your your Rob Tapper to your Sam Brian Grays Ron, Ron Brian Grays and your Ron Howard. Howard exactly. sure. Yeah. And a million other examples like yeah, that. You know, so if you're there, someone right. who's not, you know, necessarily uh, inclined in a business sense, um go find someone that is, someone who's good at that, someone who's looking for a partner, you know. Reach out to folks. Involve yourself in these social circles and, you know, God, I mean, I would love to hear more on your perspective because I know my – we were able to build a, a hell of an audience on YouTube. But God, mm -hmm. my my uh, Twitter game sucks. <laughs> so hard. So hard, you know? Well, I have a course. I'll send it to you. Please it's do. It's called Twitter Hacks. All right. Uh, plug, it's just plug. that easy? <laughs> it's literally Twitter Hacks. I got 10,000 followers in 10 weeks. Yeah. Organic. Did you buy them? <laughs> no, no. Organic. Yeah. Audience specific. And look, it, it, we'll go off on a quick tangent on, on social media since yeah. you asked about it. Um, you know, social media for me, specifically Twitter and Instagram, right. those guys, and even Facebook, all of it, you know, it's it's nice. You have to have massive numbers. Right. You're talking millions right. to make a dent because you know on YouTube, you've got almost 8 million followers, but every time you put a video out, you don't get 8 million views. Right. There's a percentage of those people that watch that, so generally that percentage is... 5%, 10%, you guys have a little bit better percentage depending on how active your audience is. Yeah. But when you post something on, you know, how many people actually interact or work on it, it's minuscule. Yeah. So for me, Twitter specifically, um, all Twitter has been really good for is, yeah, I have caught audience members there. I've gotten people there and, and, and I have people who follow me there. But what it does is I'm able to reach out to other people through Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I tweeted uh, Jim Wools. The mm -hmm. writer of Fight Club. Right. I tweeted him. I'm like, and that's it's still weird for me to say that I tweet. Like I tweeted him. I know it feels so it, unnatural. It's just the weirdest thing. Yeah. But I tweet him and I go, hey, you want to be on my show? Sure. And then I got a chance to meet and speak to the writer of Fight Club, one of my favorite movies of all time, where the first half hour is just me talking, how is David Fincher? Yeah. And how is he working with just him? Just gushing. And, yeah. And I was just completely just, you know, but that's what it's good for. Because when they go to my Twitter, they'll see almost 40,000 followers and they'll go, oh, this guy's serious. That's what Twitter is for me. I'm certainly learning to be a lot less bashful on there and reach <laughs> out to, no, but exactly like you're saying, yeah. reaching out to folks that you know, I aspire to be like, or, you yeah. know, I just appreciate something that they did, mm -hmm. you know, and letting them know that I'm a fan and I can, I'm slowly starting to learn how to insert myself into other circles, you know? It's amazing, man. You can, con it's a direct contact. Like yeah, I didn't have to call an agent. It's cool when it works. It, when it worked and it's worked a million times. Like yeah. I've gotten so many guests on, on the show purely by tweeting them out like, Hey, big fan. Love to invite you on my show and talk shop. I saw you just uh, reach yeah. out to Larry Karaszewski. I there. did. Did I tell you my connection to Larry? No. Okay. Can so you get Larry on the show for me? <laughs> I could. I, look, I could maybe ask him. But Larry is. He's. I owe him some credit, even though he probably wouldn't take it. Uh -huh. But when I mentioned my father going to the drive-ins as a kid, and Larry, yeah. and Larry probably is like, "Why is this kid always mentioning me?" But I feel inclined <laughs> to give him. I feel indebted to him in some respect, but my father and Larry were friends when they were kids. No. And Larry's dad would take them to the drive-in to go watch B-Monster movies and stuff oh like that. Oh, my God. That's you know? awesome. And I think that's uh, – you know, obviously, Larry was really into film. And <laughs> you think? You think? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so my dad – a lot of that rubbed off on my dad, which in turn rubbed off on me. So we're, so we're sort of friendly in that respect, and um, I couldn't be more happy for that guy's success, being oh a, a fellow – South Bend kid, he's he's, he's done well for himself, right? I mean, People versus Larry Flint, and uh, I mean, and then the the People what? v OJ Simpson is oh my god, that was freaking, so good. and that's I mean, yeah. That, How do you take a story that we all know, and I was still on the edge of my seat? Yeah, really <laughs> well done. That. It was so well done, incredible. But yeah, Larry, for for people who don't know, I'll put him, I'll put some information about him in the show notes. Uh, but when you see his credits, you'll go, oh, that guy, that guy. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, like I reached out. I just tweeted him just to see. Yeah, because he came up on my Twitter feed. I'm like, I would love to talk to him. Well, I hope you get to because he is he is the nicest guy and he he knows his stuff. And of encyclopedic film knowledge. I'm, I'm absolutely sure of it. Yeah. No question. So I'll ask you the um, the same four questions I ask all my, my oh, guests. God. 
Okay, you're putting me on the spot. Here we go. These are the rough ones, okay? This is the lightning round. Oh, you shit. ready? If you were going to give one piece of advice to a filmmaker starting out today, what would it be? Just go make a film. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, it, I could hear someone right yeah, like, this motherfucker no, just said, go make a film. Is that really? No, you have to you ha- <laughs> embrace the naivete, you know? Em- you have to be a crazy person to survive in this to. In- industry. You got to be nuts, man. You got to throw uh, rationality out the window and just be freaking nice. There are so many people out oh. here. That yes. we work with continually because it's a pleasure to work with them. And there's a lot of folks out here who are not, and they don't get phone calls back. So, and it's not, and it's about talent. But you'll take someone who's just slightly less talented if they're nice. You can tolerate working with them if you could sit in a room for eight hours and not kill them, or on a set for eight hours. There is a, there is a thick depth chart of folks waiting to get their shot yeah. in every field in the sh- in show business. Sure. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And the second you someone takes that ticket and they step up to the counter, if they're a jerk, you tell them to move to the back of the line. Mm-hmm. You know, it's and word gets around. Nice. And yeah, word, they do. Ever you amazing. never know who's going to be your boss. Dude, I'm te- look, look at perfect example. You, I'm talking about Larry. I just wanted to reach out to him. Yeah. Imagine if I, for whatever reason, screwed you over, and then five years from now, I'm in a meeting with Larry, and you happen to mention my name to your dad or to Larry directly, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, you're that guy that fucked over Des that day, huh? Yeah, sorry, we're not going to work with you. I've seen that happen. And, and people, look, people, it's Hollywood. It's people gossip. You know people gossip. Oh, so God. leave a good impression. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's a good piece of advice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and as big as you think the town is, it's really small. Yep. It's extremely, extremely mm-hmm. small. Um, okay. What is, the lo- what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the film business? The lesson that took me the longest to learn in life or in film business. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, in life, the most important thing that seems like the most obvious, but now in my elder years, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you just have to find happiness, you mm-hmm. know, in any way that you can. And for so long, I chased it through film and, but again, that's just a means to an end. <laughs> it's a tough business. It's a, it, it's a drug, man. It's like it's like it's like being a, a heroin addict. Like if you yeah, chase the high way. constantly through film, and that is your only happiness, you're you're gonna you're not gonna make. I it. have I have really I have spent my entire life chasing this, only now to realize that the most important thing is spending more time with the people that I love. Yes, and you can get lost chasing that. The tiger morphine drip of yep. filmmaking, you yep. know? Yep, yep, yep. yep. And before yep. you know it, you know, life has passed you by. And I know I'm, I'm speaking like I'm having some sort of midlife crisis. I'm it's like, okay. I'm only 34 years old. I understand. But <laughs> I've, I've been going, like, because I spent the last two and a half, three years oh, buried in this show. Oh, I know. Not spending enough time with friends and family. Yeah. And I'm, I, I now get to say I did, I achieved a dream of mine. I got to make a TV show. People really dig it. Um, but what matters most? You know, what do I want to go do next? And do like literally my next project now that I've wrapped Dimension 404 is spending time with my family. Yeah, that's, uh, I just asked you right before yeah. the show, like, are you, when, when are you on vacation? He's like, next week. And the, if you guys could have seen the look on <laughs> Dez's face when I asked him, like, when are you off? He's Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> it was just so dead on. Like, it was like shark eyes. And his, he was like, I'm out. Flight's booked. I am out. And I have zero plans for when I get home other than sleeping on the couch and rolling around with my. My dogs. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, the more you know, I have a few years on you. Not much. We're 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 similar genres, similar uh, vintages. Yeah. But uh, you learn that after a while because when you're young, you just it's all about the biz, the biz, the biz, the biz. You're chasing yeah. that tiger. You're chasing that tiger. Yeah. And when you get older, you know, I've got a family, I have a wife, and all that stuff. You start realizing. You look at the end of the day, and you start watching all these guys that like you know. Don Rickles just passed, and yeah. these legends. What know, a loss, right? What a fuck, oh God, he was amazing. And all these guys last year was brutal. I mean, how many famous, you know, how many people, you know, art artists yeah. did we lose last year? And you go to the end, and like, you know what? At the end, what does it really mean? Like, are you going to be thinking about on your deathbed, 
you know, how many projects you got off the ground. You know, it, art is art and that's great. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's about being with people you love. I, th I think, uh, yeah, and we're, this is turning into like the WTF podcast. It is, it deep. is. And it's, it's getting deeper. It's deeper. Man. I'm not but, uncomfortable you know. with it. I think, you know, as an artist, I definitely chase that probably because there's a piece of me that wants to leave something behind. We all do. You know? Absolutely. You know, we, a we're, legacy. we're reaching for that slice of immortality in a way, but you can't lose sight of living in the now, you mm -hmm. know, in chase of... I mean, look at Lucas. Trying to live forever. Look at Lucas. I mean, George George created, you know, Star Wars. Yeah. He's good. His legacy's pretty much locked. But he took what? I don't know. He seems like he's not happy, happy about no, the way things have gone. <laughs> well, I mean... Which but, is sad. It's so sad, isn't it? Like, I, you know, that but, guy put a freaking dent in the world. He No, he dinged the universe. Yeah. Literally. Right? He literally dinged and the universe, like Steve Jobs he, says. Boy, he just doesn't... I, 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 think, I feel... Empathy for that man. You know what I think, and I had a chance. I did have a, a chance to meet George once, and it's it's interesting to see how. I'm not sure. A lot of time, I think Coppola said it best. He goes, you know, Star Wars was kind of almost. I wouldn't say the worst thing, but it's a shame that he got caught up in it. He said, "Yeah, because he never got a chance to be a filmmaker." Right. And that's what because THX 1138 and like what I wonder what he would have done or American, American Graffiti. Graffiti. It's I mean, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant right? But once, but once you get into Star Wars, that's it. You're done. You can't get out of that. Yeah. So almost like the universe picked, I don't want to say the wrong guy for the job, but he just seems very reluctant, and it's his journey, and it's afforded him. I mean, you know, the empire that he's built. Yeah. But he took 15 fucking years off that we didn't get a Star Wars movie because he's just like I'm out. Yeah. And then we got the prequels. Then we got the prequels. There's there's moments. In, <laughs> there's moments, but we won't talk. We won't go into that. Okay. Um, final question. What are the three favorite films of all time? Three favorite films of all time. As of right now. Uh, uh, okay. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately unfo for me, they're awesome movies. I don't know if your audience is into the same uh, horror schlock that I am, but I have to go with three of the movies that um, – not necessarily the quote unquote best films, although I think they're masterpieces in their own right. But uh, these are the films that had the most significant impact on me as, as an individual mm -hmm. and as an artist and a professional working in show business. And that would be Halloween. Awesome. The first movie that, oh. you know, scared the living shit out of me. And my earliest scripts were Halloween sequels. <laughs> um, and it, by the way, real, is it true that John Carpenter still hates USC because they sued him? Yes. Because he, Very made, true. he made Halloween with USC gear, and when it became the biggest independent film of all time at its time, USC sued him for the money. I believe there is truth to that. I've also heard a story that they, when he shot a film, they had asked him if they could have the leftover set flats mm -hmm. to use yeah. at the university. Uh -huh. And he begrudgingly loaded them up on a truck and had them carted over and dumped on the loading dock at like two in the morning or something like that. Right. It's, it's a legend that they tell around some, USC that hate. he's like just dumped garbage on their, their doorstep. <laughs> I, I look, I've again, I've had mixed experience with the uh, bureaucracy sure, over at a, a, a large, sure, sure, well endowed sure. university. Sure, like sure, 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 sure. I'm not going to say anything nasty about USC. I, of uh, course. But I just thought that was funny that you said Halloween. So yeah, I just absolutely. To okay. And then uh, the right, other, other ones, and, um, and this is only because you're asking me today, every mm -hmm. day, it's a different, uh, a different mix, but America world in London mm -hmm. was another film that set me on this path. Uh, not only is it, it's just, it's just an awesome, hilarious and terrifying movie, but seeing the werewolf transformation effects done by Rick Baker, <laughs> oh. changed my, it blew my brain right open. Sure. And at that moment I knew I wanted to be a, a, a special effects makeup artist. Yep. I obviously now am a filmmaker because that business died off, but I spent, you know, 12, well, yeah, about 12 years of my life as a special make amateur special makeup artist sort of chasing mm -hmm. that dream. And that got me into writing and producing and directing all that stuff. Um, and then, oh boy, the third one, that's tough. <sighs> Maybe I got to go with another Carpenter jam. Uh, the, the thing. thing. Sure. Yeah. I just think the thing is just such a rad movie and it's just got that badass Carpenter vibe to it, you know? And again, those effects are unparalleled. I'm just such a sucker for all the for ooey, gooey, rubbery. As I, I as I know, after, stuff. after watching some of the episodes of uh, 
of your episodes from Dimension 404, I understand. Yeah. Another film <laughs> I, I my father showed me when I was way too young and I can still visualize the nightmares I had <laughs> after I had watched that film. Those those are the three movies that – again, I'm not staking claim that they're the best movies ever made, although they are fucking perfect. Um, they're the best to you. They made the, the biggest dent on me and who I am. Yeah. That's that's awesome, man. So real quick, where can um, – oh, by the way, because you said uh, The Thing and Halloween – what do you think of Robert remaking Empire, uh, Escape from New York? With Carpenter's Blessing. Right. So the news is what you're talking about. Robert, Robert Rodriguez, Rodriguez being yeah. tapped to do Escape from New York. Um, the remake, yeah. The remake. I, look, I always – there's look, I'm approaching that with caution. <laughs> I will, with all films, reserve judgment until I see it in the theater. Sure. I think – because one of my all-time favorite movies, The Thing, is a remake. Oh, God, and it wasn't that great, the remake. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. No, the original Thing was a remake. Yes. Correct. Carpenter's but Thing. But then they made The Thing. Yeah, no, but Carpenter. Carpenter's Thing is, is a, a remake, remake of, the, of thing. the Thing from Outer Space. And I think that movie is is fantastic. So, you know, I, I reserve judgment until I see what the filmmaker comes in and does with it. I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. Knowing Rodriguez is such an outspoken fanboy for mm -hmm. escape from New York that he may have some difficulty approaching it with a fresh perspective. And I'm worried that we're just going to get a lot of updated regurgitated um, you know, modernizations. You, you're going to get like the the Psycho remake with Vince Vaughn, essentially. Or Ghostbusters. I haven't seen that yet. It's the worst thing ever made. Okay. Well, I'll have it to is, check it out it and get back to you. It is absolutely the worst. I thought a lot of people liked that, no? It is the worst thing ever made. I love is Bill Murray in it? Yes, for five seconds. I'll see it. Um, But but the four girls are awesome. Yeah, they're great. And if they're great. They're great. Excellent. Yeah. And And if it was a handing off of the baton... It would have been perfect, right? But because they're like talking about it, like it's a re like they rebooted it. You don't reboot Ghostbusters. No, it's everything nowadays is a reboot cool. No, no, don't. It's reboot not a direct cool. sequel. It's not a direct reboot. It's like this <sighs> just J.J. Abrams just, and to dude give the dude credit what he did with Star Trek basically rerouted what we we're seeing in Hollywood happening today. Everything is a reboot cool. You know, like we're going to reset the timeline, not erase the original for all of those fans, but try to update it and. It, there was nothing know. like that in Ghostbusters. I would rather see with a case of uh, Escape from New York to bring it back to that. I'd rather them grab some weird, hungry, ambitious young dude, young guy, you know, and, or girl. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that would be amazing. I would love. That would be awesome. I would love to see a female and and recast Snake Plissken as a female. You oh know? my god! Can you imagine? Some, someone on oh Twitter god, said, that "Wouldn't would be it be amazing. awesome if Emily Blunt played Snake Plissken?" And I said. Fucking yep, yeah. yep, yeah. That yes. sounds. Awesome. I want to see that. Like, let's get something fresh, completely fresh. Can you imagine Emily Blunt playing? No, have they announced who they've cast I'm in the film yet? Haven't, haven't Look, yet. I, I that would uh, be amazing. Uh, I know. Uh, for some reason, well, not for some reason. Uh, it's it, for good reason. Rodriguez has garnered a lot of ill will. Uh, his last with his last few films, but yeah. you know that guy still has a soft spot in my heart. His book Rebel on the Back Lot was you know a Rebel a, without a crew. Yeah. Rebel without a crew. Yeah, yeah excuse yeah. me. It was a you know that it's was that amazing. was gospel to me and it that, still is. Yeah. And, no, and the amazing. special features on his films, ten minute film schools. His ten minute film schools uh, really helped me out in my formative years. So I I, 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 I wish the guy the best of luck. It sounds like something he's really excited in doing, and I know how freaking hard it is to make a good movie. So best of luck. And where can people find you? I'm on. Twitter. I'm in Burbank. No, no. Here's my <laughs> no, home I address. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. You can find me in Burbank uh, or back in Indiana as I go on vacation. No, I'm on Twitter at Des Dolly with a Z, no S. Come and we're going to work and we're going to work on your Twitter game. We're going to work on my Twitter game. Send me your tutorial. And then the show, of course, right now is well, it's everywhere. Um here in the states it's on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Um so as of this recording, we've um Launched four episodes on mm -hmm. Hulu: mm -hmm. Matchmaker, Cinethrax, um, Polybius, and Kronos. Yep. Um, and again, if, if, for anyone who's interested in, in in just flat out good TV, really cool genre, 
uh, sci-fi action, something that's fun, funny, and weird. It is. Don't come into this expecting Black Mirror. It's nothing like Black Mirror. None. It is. It is a roller coaster ride of a fun sci-fi show. You know. So if you're looking for fun, something fun, funny, weird, and different. Dimension 404 is the anthology show for you. So that's on Hulu here in the States. And we've got a new episode premiering uh, the last two Tuesdays in April. Uh, it's also on iTunes in Canada. Mm-hmm. And it's on HBO overseas. Nice. Nice. And then, of course, RocketJump.com. RocketJump.com. we got a lot of behind-the-scenes material and uh, uh, sort of mini chronicling of the uh, – very, very long development process <laughs> on like the show. And then a couple other fun shorts that a lot of the filmmakers around the office have put together inspired by the show. So, yeah. And, of course, you have that little YouTube channel. We got a little YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to give it a solid go. <laughs> Just year. starting out. Yeah. YouTube.com slash rocket jump. And we're going to give it a try. <laughs> see how it works out. We're going to see if we can garner a viewer, too, on the YouTube channel. <laughs> Des, man, it's been an epic interview, man. Thank it's been you. an epic six months. It has been. This is a good working with you. And, yeah. you know, for, for your fans out there, they should know how appreciative we are, how I am. Oh, thank and you. And everyone man. at Rocket Jump for the work you've done, Thanks, uh, your contributions that. to the show. This was, it was a labor of love for sure. There's no question about that. It was a lot of sacrifice that went into it mm-hmm. and uh, just a hell of a lot of elbow grease. And we couldn't have done it without you. You did an amazing Thank job. You, man. Appreciate you guys, that. if you're fans of Alex, you should definitely check out the show just for that alone because his color work is it's unparalleled. And if there's any mistakes, I didn't do it. Exactly. <laughs> Neither did I. It was somebody else. Des, man, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, dude. Love talking to you. Man, I want to thank Des. Uh, he's a super busy guy right now who just finishing up the last episodes of uh, – of D404 for Hulu, and he took a couple hours out of his day for this interview because I told him how important it was for us to get on the the podcast. I wanted to get this information to you guys. So, Des, man, thanks again so much for taking the time out. I hope you guys picked up a lot, man. I absolutely did. I plan to now have 10 million followers on my YouTube in, in a matter of weeks, uh, if not uh, hours. <laughs> but, um, but it was great information and, and really great information about how someone who's actually done it did it. You know, as a lot of times people talk about stuff and, oh, well, you know, in theory this would work or in theory that would work. Well, this guy and and his partners did it. You know, they did it this way. And there's no reason why you guys can't do it too. You know, the world is big enough that there's so many people in the world that you guys can create your own niches for what you're trying to do, your own audiences for what you're trying to do. There's absolutely no reason why you can't. And that's what YouTube has has proven to everybody. That's what the internet's proven to everybody. Sometimes I'll run across a site or a, a personality or or a, a channel and go, wow, man, these guys, I've never even heard of these guys and they got 5 million followers or 2 million followers or a million followers. And you're like, wow, there really is an audience for almost anything, you know? Now, the size of that audience is another story, but you can build a niche audience. And if you build a passionate audience, you can do amazing things. Look what you know we've been able to do as a, the, the tribe, the Indie Film Hustle tribe. You know, we got Meg made, you know, you got crowdfunded, you guys helped me with that. I'm hoping you guys are gonna help me with uh, us trying to break iTunes, as I as I call it, and I'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks as we release it in the summer. Uh, but you know, it's amazing what a group of people who are passionate about something can do. So I hope this inspired you guys. It inspired the hell out of me. And again, Des, thank you very, very much for dropping some major knowledge bombs uh, for the, the tribe and myself. And if you want links to anything we talked about on the episode, head over to anyfilmhustle.com forward slash 152 for the show notes. And don't forget to head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking and screenwriting audiobooks from Audible. All right, guys, this episode's long enough. I'm out of here. Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 